Well, good evening, everybody, and thanks for joining us once again on It's Your Money with Jeff Duncan. We're here every Saturday night at 6.30, and you can catch Duncan Financial Management on KTRS, the Big 550, at 9 a.m. on Sundays, 9 to 10 a.m., and you can catch me on the McGraw Show at about 6.50 Monday through Friday, giving some pre-market business news. With me today is Jim Blaze of Blaze Associates, and Jim, thank you for coming down today. Hello. Thanks for having me. And your specialty is? Uh, estate planning, wills and trust, and individual tax law. Okay, and how long have you been doing this type of business? Uh, 28 years now. 28 years, mm -hmm. so you just started. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and 10 years with my own law firm. Okay, and the name of your law firm? Is Blaze and Associates. Okay, and you're located? In Tepair. Okay. You've probably met with many people when it comes to estate planning, uh, wills, powers of attorney, all that good stuff. How many families or individuals that you think that you have sat down with over the course of your 28 years? Uh, over a thousand, I know that much. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get to the basics. Many people come into my office and they may ask me some financial issues. And uh, one of the questions I do ask them is, what is the status of your legal affairs? And they kind of look at me funny. It's like, why would the financial ad advisor be asking these type of questions? And quite frankly, I've known people that have gone through probate that have ended up in the hospital or were un unable to do anything for them because they didn't have powers of attorney, health care directive. So I'm going to kind of go down a list of okay. items that I know you would be asking people. And I ask these people, you know, do they have these affairs in order? Uh, what is a living will? Uh, living will, that's a good question because a living will is one of the biggest misnomers out there because people are going living will. Yeah. Um, it has nothing to do with a will. Okay. That's the first thing. It is a, a document. It's actually not used much anymore in Missouri. Okay. But it's a document whereby you declare that if I am incapacitated and there is no hope of my recovery, Okay. I declare that certain forms of life support should be withdrawn. Okay. Now, what are they replacing the living will with another document? Or yeah. The, the problem is that Missouri had a living will. It still does have a statutory living will. Okay. And people had been using that living will form for years. But the problem was the form was very, very limited. It almost mm -hmm. never applied. Okay. And so what happened was about oh, 15, 20 years ago now, people may remember the Nancy Cruzan case, and mm -hmm. that was a Missouri case mm -hmm. that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And long story short, the U.S. Supreme Court was issued a, a ruling which was much broader than the Missouri statute, okay. permitted withholding much more things. So what happened then was um, I was part of the Missouri Bar Committee that we drafted a Missouri Bar Association a living will, we call that a health care directive, okay. so we wouldn't mistake it with the living will form. Mm -hmm. And it also had in there a health care power of attorney. So you were allowed to first state your intentions about what you thought about life support, but also designate someone as your surrogate with your spouse and or kids to make health care decisions for you, not just pull the plug type decisions, but any type of a medical decision if you're incapacitated. Okay. So that form, by the way, can be found on the Missouri Bar website, which okay. is mobar.org. You know, a lot of people, uh, this brings up a good point, will tell me, you know, I went online, I got these documents mm -hmm. or that document, yeah. and I tell them, it's always good to sit down for professionals such as yourself just to go through and make sure you have everything in order because unfortunately I've seen people you know get something online not that there's anything wrong with it and all of a sudden they needed that document mm -hmm. unfortunately it wasn't prepared properly didn't right. have the correct language maybe it was not even signed properly mm -hmm. um, Jim besides let's say a living will uh, what is a will by the way if we remove the word living what is a will a uh, last a will is the, your last will and testament and what your last will and testament allows you to do is really only one thing it allows you to designate who will receive your assets when you die okay if you don't have a last will and testament the state will decide where your assets go when you die and that goes through probate uh, well let, that's another misnomer about last will and testaments. Last wills do go through probate. A lot okay. of people think, if I have a will, I don't have to go through probate. But actually, if you just have a will, you will go through probate. And probate is what? In Missouri, it's a very cumbersome court process. I say Missouri because a lot of other states have made it a lot. They've streamlined, streamlined the whole process. Mm -hmm. But in Missouri, probate can take easily a year or more. And it's a process of getting the assets out of your name and into the name of your heirs. And it's a court process. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of court fees or a lot of legal fees, but probably the biggest problem with probate is the time. In Missouri, again, typically it takes at least a year 
for your family to go through probate. Okay, I know a lot of people, you're right, have come into my office and they say, oh, Jeff, I have a will I'm taking care of legally. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, a will is meant to go through probate. Right. So if you want to avoid probate, there's other ways of uh, avoiding probate. Mm -hmm. One of them happens to be what we call a beneficiary deed right. in the state of Missouri. What is right. a beneficiary deed? Well, let me say one thing. Missouri is very progressive in that area. We are one of the few states in the country that, that allows a beneficiary deed. And all it is is a deed whereby you basically add a beneficiary to your home. Okay. It, it relates to any form of real estate, but usually your home. And it allows you, for example, if I'm married, I can have myself, my wife, on my deed like I do right now. But then I can add my children as the beneficiaries after we both pass. And that then allows the home to go to my children immediately okay. upon the death of the survivor of us and avoid probate. Okay, so that's a big item because the biggest asset most people have is their right. home. And you really want to take advantage of that if you live in Missouri. Illinois has something similar, but not quite the same. Okay, let's say somebody, uh, well, I want to get to trust here in a second, but powers of attorney, what is a power of attorney? What does a power of attorney allow somebody to do? Well, both Missouri and Illinois, there are actually two forms of powers of attorney. One's for property and one's for health care. We've already talked about the health care one a little bit. Um, if you're incapacitated, it allows you to designate your spouse or children or siblings to make any health care decision for you that you could have made. Okay. A power of attorney for property allows that same person to make any decisions about your property that you could have made. And mm -hmm. let me just give you an example why that's so important because, again, there's misconceptions out there. Most people think, for example, well, if I'm married, my spouse can make those decisions for me. Uh -huh. Actually, that's not the law in any state. Okay. Okay. So a simple example, if I become incapacitated and I can no longer live in my home. And right. my spouse feels, well, this home is too much trouble, it's too big for me. My spouse cannot sell that home, okay, without a power of attorney unless she goes into court to do that. Okay. And that's probate. Okay? okay. So the power of attorney allows her basically just to sign my name and sell the home. It allows her to do things like deal with my 401k or IRA. Right. A lot of people think, well, the spouse can just do that. The spouse is the beneficiary. Right. Well, the spouse would only be the beneficiary after I die. Okay. While I'm alive, we need to use those funds for my benefit, my spouse's benefit, maybe even my children's benefit. Right. And a power of attorney allows you to do that too. Now you can kind of see why I ask people these questions right. because I've run into uh, instances where the spouse, mom or dad are incapacitated, unable to make their own decisions, have dementia or whatever it may be, and all of a sudden they need money for their care, but unfortunately they don't have the correct legal documents to make the financial decisions, then it's kind of like, oh, it's an ugly situation. It lasts six months, a year, things don't get done, it's very time consuming. And this is why I ask these questions to people. Do you have these documents? In fact, when should you update these documents? When should you have them reviewed? One comment about the power of attorney real quick is yeah. that um, you don't just have a power of attorney, you have to also look at the provisions of it. Okay. And in Missouri, as well as Illinois, you have to specifically provide certain things. For example, if you want to be able to have your agent make gifts to your spouse or children. Okay. If that's not specifically provided in the power of attorney, the spouse doesn't have that power. And there are a lot of other things like that too. So you can't just have a power of attorney, you have to have it um, very clearly provided for. Um, on, your, on your question about, what was your question about? Well, we're gonna talk about trust. We're yeah. gonna go to yeah, we'll uh, a brief break, a brief message. Okay. Uh, we'll be while. right back and uh, we'll talk about trust. <laughs> 